I'm really excited to be um, the first part of the historic raving realism double bill that we're going <laughs> to stop and end this conference with. Um, happy to warm up for Russ any day of the week. <laughs> so I'm going to try to uh, be pithy and probably fail. Uh, so I'm, sometimes there's a handout which you get handed out. If somebody other than me can do that, that would be awesome. Um, I'm sometimes going to skip over some stuff on the handout, um, just so we can go more efficiently. So I want to talk about the methodology of metaethics in this talk. And for those of you who care, the way I think about metaethics is as the project of explaining how actual ethical thought and talk, and what, if anything, that thought and talk is distinctively about, fits into reality. Um, there's a lot to unpack there. David Puckett and I have a paper in progress in which we do that unpacking. I'm not going to do any of it right now. I apologize. Um, now, disagreement, we've been talking about disagreement in this conference, and disagreement has played an enormous number of very central roles in that ethics, and I'm mostly not going to talk about any of them. Um, instead, my focus in this talk is going to be on the role that epistemological considerations, which centrally include disagreement, play in constructive theorizing, defending the credibility of systematic metaphysical theories. Okay? And so the talk is kind of methodological in nature, but I'm going to proceed in a very selfish way by sort of pointing us very gen gently, gently, generally, um, at an exemplary metaethical view, a view that I like, I'm going to call joint carbon normative realism, and then I'm going to explain the epistemological uh, issues that I want to raise in the context of that theory. So first of all, let's talk about John Carbon normative realism. This is the thesis that some actual ethical properties carve nature at its joints. Um, what does this mean? I like to sort of warm people up to this idea by thinking about an example from Karen Bennett. Karen Bennett asks you to imagine a conversation between two people who are disagreeing about whether some green apple flavored nonsense in a martini glass counts as a martini. Um, I take it there are some the traditionalists who might say no, and some the hipsters who might say I don't care, and <laughs> some other people who might just for bloody mindedness say yes, it's a determinate fact. Um, you know, one thing you might think, depending on your views about thought and talk, you might think there's a just, just a determinately true answer. Right? One, one party to this dispute is getting things right. Um, Suppose that the relatively narrow characterization of martini is of just objectively in the English language the, the correct uh, way to understand the extension of the martini concept. You might still imagine well, there's a way in which the disagreement is sort of not that interesting. We can imagine, after all, another possible <coughs> linguistic community in which they have a broader concept, much like the concept of the person who has thinks that the green apple flavor nonsense is a martini, the concept they're sort of imagining themselves out. Right? And it, you might think, at the very least, if that linguistic community proceeded in that way, they wouldn't be making any interesting sort of mistake. And so if the person who thinks that, in fact, martinis can include the green apple flavor nonsense um, sticks to her guns and then says, I don't care what the rest of you guys say, I'm going to use martini in this way, she's not really going to be making a mistake either. So contrast this idea with the following pair of cases. Scientific theorists deploy the concept electron, all kinds of important and interesting theoretical concept, contexts. We can imagine an alternative scientific community which deploys a different concept, a concept I'll call electron, um, which, as we would put it, um, picks out electrons in some contexts and protons in other contexts. Um, and suppose that the Gru scientists in this community um, they nonetheless have a very successful scientific program. They have loved to develop lots of scientific laws. They're able to predict and explain lots of uh, phenomena. Turns out their laws are much longer and more complicated looking than ours, <laughs> right? Because uh, it turns out that to capture the relevant phenomena in terms of your electron, you've got to say a lot of weird stuff. Um, and so you might say, well, what objection to these group scientists is it's going to be like less efficient and less fun to work with, the, your concepts. That's an objection to your concept. But a certain sort of state of mind you might have, I have this state of mind and I invite you to at least consider entering into it yourself, I think there's a deeper kind of mistake that the group scientists are making. 
that their concept, the groove concept, fails to carve nature out its joints in the way that the concept electron you might think does. That there's, as it were, in reality, a really interesting distinction. There's an interesting similarity amongst the electrons and an interesting distinction amongst the electrons and the protons. And the Groot electron concept just kind of slurs over those distinctions and similarities in a way which um, makes it kind of less apt as a description of reality. So call that kind of defect, if you think such a thing is possible, reality matching failure. So reality matching failure can come in degrees. You can have better and worse matches. And you might take this notion, and you might think, well, there are a lot of different things people mean by realism about some particular domain of discourse. One thing you might mean by realism is you might think that realism about a domain of discourse, the sort of joint carbon conception of realism, is that the things that we're talking about with that discourse, in fact, carve nature of its joints. <coughs> so if you have this picture and you think that this kind of structure is something which it makes sense to pay attention to when we're theorizing, you might sort of take this kind of structure, I'll call it sometimes elite structure, as a target, as like what one should be trying to understand and disclose in scientific and metaphysical inquiry. So if you have this joint carbon conception of realism, that's going to be a very natural sort of methodological complement. So, so far this is just a sort of picture of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about joint carbon. And I should say much, much more about this than I'm not going to. Um, here's a really interesting question, though. Why might a normative realist want to be a joint carbon? So lots of people say that they're normative realists. Some people say they're normative anti-realists. Again, realism is this kind of football term. People mean all kinds of different things by it. I think one kind of set of motivations that leads people to think that they should be realists pushes you in favor in, in the direction of being a joint carbon realist. And let me try and illustrate this idea. Think again about the case of the Martini concept and the alternative community that has the alternative Martini concept that picks out, amongst other things, the green apple flavored nonsense. Right? The thought is, there's sort of nothing particularly to be said in favor of one of those conceptual practices rather than the other. Well, imagine a normative analog of that. This is something which I've written about elsewhere, which has been treated in somewhat more careful detail recently by Marty Eklund in some papers in the book manuscript. Um, imagine that there's a alternative, uh, there's a linguistic community which has broadly normative concepts that play very similar roles to our normative concepts. They function in deliberation, etc., very much the way that ours does. But they pick out, nonetheless, a very different kind of extension to the extension that our normative concepts pick out. You might think this is just kind of parallel to the Martini example. You might think, if that were possible, and I'm not even claiming this is possible, your view about semantics, in fact, my view about semantics might suggest that it's probably not possible. But you might think if it were possible, there'd be a sense in which you'd want to say that if you're a normative realist, that this community is making a really important kind of mistake. Right? Their normative concepts, although, as it were, they're successfully referring with them and saying true things, they're exhibiting an important kind of failure. And I think there's a sense in which you can just say, this is just the practical analog of the kind of reality matching failure you say, see in the case of the guru scientists. So I think one way to think about a motivation for being a kind of uh, joint carbon normative realist is to take those kinds of things seriously. A bunch of other bullet points where I say, hey, I've taken these resources around and tried to solve some problems in metaethics. Not going to talk about that at all today. Um, last thing about this view. People in metaethics often care a lot, including myself, about debates between naturalists and non-naturalists amongst normative realism. I'm not going to talk really that much about that, other than to say that as I understand the joint carbon picture, it's just compatible with both of those views. Okay. So that's the view that I'm going to take as my exemplar in order to illustrate the methodological points that I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to start by talking about an idea which I'm going to adapt from Chris Peacock. This is the idea that when one is theorizing about metaphysics of a domain, one faces the following pressure, which we'll call the integration challenge. And that pressure is to give simultaneously plausible accounts of the metaphysics and the epistemology of that domain. Why might you 
think this pressure sort of arose at all. I take it it arises in part because your account of the metaphysics of a domain can fit naturally with some views about how epistemic access to that domain is possible and fit much less naturally with other such views. Okay. So suppose that we take this integration challenge seriously. Here's a really important question. What, insofar as we're going to show that the metaphysics of a domain is plausible, what would it have to say about the epistemology? And I think this is a, obviously an incredibly complicated and important question, and I am going to say some very brief and hand-wavy things. But here are two very brief and hand-wavy things. First, you heard a lot about this this morning. By the way, a theme of this talk is just going to be how much I agree with other people who have given talks in this conference. Um, <coughs> so you heard from this morning from Rafe about how plausible it is that you should be a rationalist about ethical inquiry. I reckon, yeah, it's pretty plausible. Um, that I'm going to say something more modest, than what, considerably more modest, several orders of magnitude more modest than what Rafe said <laughs> this morning. I'm going to say, um, there are some striking rationalist appearances in ethical inquiry. And part of meeting the integration challenge is potentially going to be to vindicate those appearances. And by the rationalist appearances, I mean, basically, sometimes if you're trying to answer ethical questions, you should go and look, right? Is someone going to suffer horribly if I eat this sandwich? Right? Um, but sometimes, you don't need to go and look, or the only reason why you're going looking is because you're trying to apply some deeper principle. And when you think about the deepest principle, trying to decide whether the principle of utility is the correct general ethical theory, the most fundamental level, it's sort of a little hard to understand what, what you would be going and looking for to answer that question. So that's, that's just that's the initial motivation. That's all I wanted to say about that. The second striking appearance about moral epistemology is that ethical inquiry is freaking hard, OK? Um, now here, this conference is about disagreement, so I should say one striking piece of evidence for this is the scope, strength, persistence of reason, apparently reasonable disagreement in ethics. Right. Maybe that disagreement, insofar as it's reasonable, is not ultimately fundamental and would not ultimately be reasonable insofar as it's fundamental. But it looks apparently reasonable, and it looks very widespread, and it looks persistent. Um, that's pretty striking. And I think it's striking not merely to sort of point to this particular case, but to think about a bunch of contrasts. Think about another domain, which has apparently a broadly rationalist seeming epistemology, mathematics. Uh, it seems to me that mathematics, in contrast to ethics, you see you know, what Kuhn would call normal science, the accumulation in like extraordinary volume of just straightforward results, adding uncontroversial pieces to the, our knowledge in this domain. And that's just an overwhelmingly central feature of what you see in the inquiry in that domain. It just seems to me there's very little that can be um, compared to that in the philosophy. You might have this sort of niggling thought, well, maybe it has something to do with the fact that like philosophy, uh, that, that like ethics is normative and mathematics isn't, and it's the normativity that makes it hard. I, if by normative you just mean normative, I don't think that could be right. So I take chess to be normative, right? You can make correct and incorrect moves. You can make better and worse moves. Um, but nonetheless, here's this striking feature about chess. Even when there are some very interesting, reasonable disagreements about whether a given move is the best move for white in a given position, all the parties to that disagreement can agree on, like, there is a certain algorithmic process. That if we ran through that algorithmic process and provided enough computing power to that process, we would get an answer, and that answer would be more or less just positive. I think mo many central ethical disputes, there's nothing like that that we can point to. Well, think about other normative domains, like etiquette or the law. Again, there's lots of interesting disputes there, lots of interesting disagreements, some of which are more or less persistent. A lot of those disagreements, though, again, it seems to me could be resolved to a much greater extent than in ethics. These are matters of degree, simply by pointing to further empirical information. And in the residue cases, I'm inclined to think that a big part of the explanation of the residue cases might be that at least lots of people who are participants in these disputes have moralized conceptions of etiquette and the law. These are like serious views about etiquette and the law. Um, and that would potentially explain why there's this important residue of persistent disagreement. So if we want, in fact, to find a nice parallel as far as the 
rationalist appearances and apparent difficulty of ethical inquiry, you really want to look for something like philosophical metaphysics. That's a, that's a good parallel case. Um, so those are, those are a couple of plausibility constraints. And I take it that the challenge, insofar as you're going to pursue the integration challenge, is to either vindicate those appearances, explain how your theory about metaphysics is compatible with those, with those appearances, or to debunk them. And I think, really interesting question about when you should vindicate, when you should debunk. I'm just going to assume, pro tem, to help myself to more assumptions here, um, that we should be aiming to vindicate. And what I want to see is how the normative realist could do on that front. Now, I think that when one has this in mind, it can at least, and this is going to be yet another extremely fast and loose part of this talk. I'm, I'm painting with broad brushstrokes here, and so many times I will be talking about your favorite view and saying things that you think are extremely fast about your favorite view. I apologize. Um, one thing that might make the integration challenge, especially for the normative realist, seem pressing is that it might seem that when you look at standard versions of normative realism, that it's actually the standard versions do not do a great job at this challenge. So think, for example, about the non-naturalist. A very standard thing that many non-naturalists say, there are non-naturalists who don't say this, but there are non-naturalists who say P for almost any P. So it's very hard to figure out exactly what's, <laughs> what unifies the, the sociological group of people call, who call themselves non-naturalists. But at least very many non-naturalists claim that it's a distinctive feature of the view that ethical facts and properties are causally inefficacious. And this has led many people to have the following anxiety. Well, if we can't be sort of causally sensitive to the ethical facts and properties, how do we have any knowledge about them at all? Um, this should remind you of an Asarab's challenge, right? Philosophy of mathematics. Um, and then I think there's a standard thing that non-naturalists say in response. Like, how is ethical natural po knowledge possible? Well, I'm going to give you a story, for example, an intuitionistic story about how knowledge is possible, where that intuitionistic, intuitionistic story does not sort of traffic in causal notions and part of its fundamental explanation about stuck access. That seems like a good response to me. Um, not myself sure if ultimately it's the correct view, but I think for the non-naturalists, it's a good prima facie response here. But there's a further puzzle. Presumably, the intuitionist is going to have the same broad kind of epistemology for mathematics. And so now we have the following puzzle. If we have the same kind of metaphysics and the same kind of broad epistemology for both of these two domains, why again do we have this striking asymmetry and how difficult inquiry is in the one domain rather than the other? So turn instead to think about the naturalist. Now it turns out there are many, many ways that one could be a naturalistic realist. Um, but one kind of problem faced at least by many naturalistic realists is accounting for the rationalist appearances. So I am just going to barely even describe and simply mention one, I think, really very good and canonical naturalistic realist view of that due to Richard Boyd. Um, according to Richard Boyd, uh, moral facts and moral, fact, moral kinds are what he calls homeostatic property cluster kinds. Um, that is, they're causally interesting unified kinds which have various underlying mechanisms which uh, underwrite various kinds of Keller's Paribus laws involving them. Um, and the metaphysics that he supports for ethical facts and properties same types of properties. He really declines. He doesn't really roll with facts and properties so much. Um, he is very similar to the one that he, he uh, in fact, it's just the same thing that he says about kinds, for, for example, the human sciences. And as a result, he predicts methodological continuity with the human sciences. But this is striking because the human sciences, again, on their face, <coughs> look considerably less rationalistic in character. Very little of the best contemporary neuroscience is being done from the armchair, I think, for example. Um, and again, in most of these sciences, you see the kind of pattern of normal science accumulation of knowledge that you don't typically see in ethics. So again, I don't want to claim that these are like anything even remotely resembling 
serious objections to these views as I spell them out. It's just kind of an initial challenge to sort of give a taste of why this is not a trivial kind of challenge. Okay. So, how should we proceed? Well, I think in thinking about addressing this challenge, I want to make one more, I want to put one more methodological piece of the puzzle on the table. And this is to talk about the significance of two different kinds of goals that you can have in philosophical theorizing. One goal I'm going to call the substantial coherence goal. And this goal, I think, is familiar to almost any philosopher. You say, I'm a modal realist. And somebody says, how is that even, like, how could you even, like, I don't understand. So the substantial coherence goal is just be like, let me tell you a story about metaphysics and a story about epistemology and a story about semantics such that when you put those stories together, you can understand that's how possible modal realism, right? And notice that you might scratch that itch. And the, once you've done this, the person who you've, who you've explained this to might think, ah, now I see how that could be true. I mean, obviously still false, but now I at least see how it could be true. You might have done very little to enhance the credibility of the view in virtue of having convinced your interlocutor that there is a coherent bit of uh, sort of philosophical space to be occupied here. Now, I think the substantial coherence goal is really philosophically important. I think an enormous amount of philosophical progress consists in showing that various kinds of options that we haven't taken seriously enough in previous philosophical theorizing, in fact, are options that deserve serious exploration. And I think that there are a lot of bad arguments in philosophy that function as kind of arguments by exhaustion, where there are often just too few options on the table. So that like, once you've rejected theory A and theory B, you really shouldn't be concluding that theory C is the right view, because it turns out there's roughly a whole alphabet of other alternatives that haven't yet been explored. So I think this is very philosophically important. But I think there comes to be a time in every young philosopher's life <laughs> when her thoughts start turning to defending the substantial credibility of the view that she favors. And I think if you have this kind of goal, the rules of the game change a little bit. I think if you have this kind of goal, what you should be thinking about is insofar as you're addressing certain kinds of challenges, you should be trying to address those challenges in ways that potentially that, that are best suited to enhance the substantial credibility of your, goal, of your view. Now, suppose that you have the credibility goal and you are thinking about the integration challenge. So you want to think about the connection between metaphysics and epistemology as it applies to your meta-ethical view. I think a very plausible thought here is that insofar as you're thinking about the epistemological side of this, you ought to be doing what I'm going to call non-fundamental epistemology. And here there's just going to be more agreement this time with some stuff that Rafe said earlier this morning, right? Rafe said, like, in the context of ethics, like, there are these mid-level ethical claims that we, like, know some stuff about, and the fa fundamental stuff we might be, like, completely hopeless about, and, um, again, I don't want to be quite as optimistic about the mid-level things and quite as pessimistic as, about the underlying things, but I think the general point is quite right. Um, and I want to illustrate this by making a somewhat tangentious claim about methodology and applied ethics. There's a, a way of thinking about applied ethics which takes the word applied very seriously, where what you do is, like, first you sit down and you're like, the right fundamental ethical theory is this version of rule, con rule consequentialism or contractualism, and then take it over here and think about non-human animals, how they work. Just apply my theory and away we go. Um, I think those sorts of projects can be interesting, but they're most interesting as sort of finding out what the consequences of somebody's rule consequentialist view are. They're not very interesting as far as changing the credibility of various propositions about how we should relate to non-human animals are, because any fundamental ethical theory which is determinate enough to allow you to draw conclusions about animal ethics is something about which we should have probably have very low credences. Whereas, I think there are lots of mid-level principles which are extremely plausible, which are compatible with being spelled out in lots of different ways by underlying theories, which um, you can then use to mount actually very powerful arguments in applied ethics. Okay. And so I think the same thing is true in epistemology. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and illustrate this methodology of trying to find non-fundamental 
epistemological claims and think about the integration challenge in terms of those claims. And so here's the non-fundamental epistemological claim that I'm going to point to. I want to talk about what I'm going to call the significance of methodological naturalism. Now, naturalism is one of these words. It's another football word. Sometimes it means something incredibly ambitious. Sometimes it means something incredibly weak. I mean the following thing by it. I mean the idea that a bunch of the familiar sciences, physics, geology, chemistry, etc., are paradigms of epistemic success. Um, they are some of our best grip on what it is for a human intellectual endeavor, cooperatively understood, to make substantial progress in understanding the nature of reality. Okay. Um, now, if I have my background joint carving picture, and I put that together with this familiar thought, what you get is the optimistic thought that these sciences provide us with epistemic access to the joints of nature. Now, I should say that we should think about that in the following way. We shouldn't think about epistemic success in an individualistic way, which are in general in terms of social epistemology here, like the community of inquirers and the virtue of engaging in these kinds of research comes to have better access to things. <coughs> and we're going to need some notion of approximation to carving nature's joints, which is sort of analogous to what philosophers of science talk about when they talk about truth likeness. Right? So if you're just focused on truth, you need a notion of approximate truth and truth likeness. <coughs> I think you're going to need a, a, a notion of approximate joint carving, something like this. So, so that's the sort of joint carver's read on this kind of almost platitudinous form of methodological natural. So how do, how does that epistemic access work? Well, one thing I think that's striking is that scientific methodology has some apparently rationalistic elements. I think there's lots of ways you can try to make this point. I'll just pick on one. Just think about amplitude of inference for a second. Right? In general, scientific inferences take as their data um, observations of actual things actual particular things, and then they make inferences about the unobserved, the general, the counterfactual, on this basis. And famously, it at least looks a little puzzling how those principles, the principles that take you from the actual to the counterfactual, for example, could themselves be satisfactorily and ultimately justified purely on the basis of evidence just about the actual. Right? Um, and so there's at least some pressure to sort of think that these inferences are based on some sort of basic rational inference principle. Now, of course, there's tons of work in this area, lots of people who are ultimately going to give a story about this epistemology, which is not rationalist. But that's okay. I just want to point out the appearances here are rationalistic appearances. Just as in the case of ethics, the appearances are that the methodology is rationalistic. How ultimately at the fundamental epistemological level we should understand this is something which we should not be trying to adjudicate insofar as we're engaged in non-fundamental epistemology. And so this seems to suggest the following cheerful thought when you put the pieces together so far. The fact that we use broadly rationalistic methods in part is itself apparently no barrier to our having epistemic access to the joints of nature. All right. Now, once we have this kind of paradigm, we might also ask, well, Let's look at the paradigm. And in terms of thinking about the paradigm, think about what the paradigm can teach us about better and worse epistemic access. And I think the paradigms teach us a lot of things. And this is going to be, again, embarrassingly quick and sort of hand wavy. So in general, the more closely and richly empirically disciplined um, a claim is, the more epistemically robust it is. So for example, I can be much more justified, can be much better justified in making certain claims about what the GDP of Canada in 2015 is than I can in making claims about what the GDP of the Roman Empire was in 180. Just because there's so much more evidence available that allows me to make a closely approximate prediction in the first case. Similarly, 
a ton of progress in science is enabled in virtue of the fact that scientists have learned to formalize and operationalize and mathematize various kinds of research questions. And doing so, I think, is very hard to resist, thinking that that has been a central part of what has constituted the context for scientific progress. There's been one sort of mark of success and excellence in science is disciplining by interscientific connections. So if you're doing biochemistry, you are, as it were, um, constrained from below by theoretically rich, healthy research program in chemistry, and from above by relevant work in biology. In fact, things get super more fine-grained than that. That's a really toy sort of picture. And finally, one of the marks of scientific methodology <coughs> that has allowed it to progress, I think, is the development of robust theorizer bias defeating mechanisms. And again, we could talk about a lot of different things here, but I take, you know, an easy paradigm here is the development of double-blind research methods for research involving human subjects. Okay. So, I've just said a bunch of stuff. What's the relevance of this bunch of stuff about science and stuff? Um, well, here I take it is what we should think. We should think we have a paradigm of epistemic success, and that paradigm gives us good provisional reasons to have certain general kinds of beliefs about what relatively more or less epistemically successful um, theoretical activities can look like. And if we take those insights over and think about the Giancarlo Brown of realism, I think it suggests some very interesting things. So the good news is that joint carving realism itself is no barrier to epistemic access. It looks like on the joint carver's reading of methodological naturalism, you can have access to elite properties. And it looks like that access can be had by methodologies which include apparently rationalistic elements. Okay. That's the first part. That's the good news. The bad news is that so many of the methodological marks of quality science that I mentioned down, down there at the bottom of the left-hand page of page two um, are simply missing or less prominent methods. And now we need to be careful because this is not an all or nothing thing. This is a case-by-case -case kind of thing. This is sort of an in general kind of thing. So there are certainly cases in ethics where for all intents and purposes, interesting ethical discussion of some question would just be settled by the right kind of empirical investigation, and sometimes that happens. That's, that's great. Right? Um, but those cases are less common, especially in the sort of more foundational theory side of ethics. Similarly, there are areas in ethics where I think formal methods have made enormous amounts of contributions to our understanding. So within the consequentialist tradition, for example, there's been enormous work developing formal versions of various kinds of consequentialist principles. And in virtue of doing so, new kinds of problems and paradoxes have been discovered that would be almost impossible to have figured out before. New kinds of um, interesting consequences have been discovered. Um, new kinds of resources have been discovered. These things are really interesting. <clears throat> but there's sort of limitations to the, the, the importance of these things. So I, I think in general, these things help us to understand certain projects and research projects much better. But I think in general, these kinds of results don't sort of help, for example, to significantly enhance the credibility of consequentialism in general. It just help us to understand within that research program how to think about it. And the virtues and vices of certain exemplifications. Interdeoretic connections. I think I'm a big fan of something that Rafe said in, um, in his 2007 book. That, like, really good way of engaging in philosophical theorizing is to be aggressively interdisciplinary. I think the same thing is true in ethics. Um, but I think the significance of this is less marked than it is in the case of many scientific domains, just because the inter-theoretic connections are often to other parts of philosophy, which are themselves epistemically, comparatively speaking, a bit shabby as compared to, for example, mm -hmm. biology. Right. And finally, for at least many kinds of questions in ethics, it's very, very hard to develop the kinds of robust theorizer defeat mechanisms that you might think mark certain other kinds of disciplines. And this sort of leads me to my next conjecture, which is that these are not, as it were, contingent features of how people currently do ethics, which sort of are marks of our incompetence collectively or something like this. 
Rather, I think it's the nature of certain subject matters and questions that can make some of these marks of quality scientific methods that I've been mentioning inapt. Right? Um, there are lots of um, macroeconomic questions for which it's just impossible to do a nice double-blind research experiment. Um, <clears throat> Never going to get that by the ethics board, even if you can just take over Bolivia for the purposes of economics uh, theorizing. Right? Um, I, maybe you can do this if you talk to the CIA, actually. I'm not sure. They might be into it. Um, CIA, IMF, here's my research project. Um, in general, some of these things are simply, there are certain kinds of questions we simply cannot answer using certain kinds of methods. And I think that the explanation of why it is that in many respects, our ethical research looks less promising in these dimensions, is that many of the kinds of ethical questions that we're asking are exactly questions where many of these ingredients are inapt. So for example, if you think about the just very, very broad brushstrokes, the balance between the significance of observational and apparently rationalistic ingredients, it looks to me as if metaphysics and ethics sort of cluster on one side where the rationalistic ingredients play a much larger role, and for example, etiquette and the law cluster on the other side, where the empirical facts are going to play a much greater explanatory role in answering many of the questions that we care about in those domains. Similarly, if you think about formal tractability, I think it makes sense, again, to put metaphysics and ethics on the one side, or at least for many of the central questions in these domains, formal methods are going to have very limited significance, as opposed, for example, to mathematics and chess, where for very many of the central kinds of questions we care about, these kinds of formal methods are going to be extremely powerful. And I should say, right, there are some very interesting important <coughs> questions in mathematics which are not amenable to these kinds of formal methods. But those are exactly the kinds of questions that tend to be hived off and called the philosophy of math and turn out to be just as controversial and hard as most other parts of philosophy. All right. So what are, some, what are the upshots of this little story that I've been telling you guys? Well, we can think about some upshots for Epistemology, conditional on the joint carbon normative realism. Joint carbon normative realism on this picture suggests a really modest form of epistemic rationalism for ethics. Right? Um, maybe we are just persistently in a relatively poor epistemic position in ethics, and the right kind of realist picture about the metaphysics can help to vindicate that appearance. And I think it's important not to overstate how depressing this is, because after all, this isn't a perfectly skeptical conclusion. And one of the things we care about with ethics is we care about practically deploying the conclusions we get. And nothing that I've said suggests that we can't develop <coughs> comparative plausibility judgments and use those to guide our actions in ways that might be relatively reasonable, even if fallible in a, to a depressing degree. Um, Second, though, I think that the story I've told, if all goes extremely smoothly, helps to enhance the credibility of the Joint Carbon Normative Realist Project in virtue of having told a story on which the Joint Carbon Project vindicates, gives a sort of vindicating answer to the integration challenge that I spelled it out. Okay. Now, having said that, I want to take most of it back. Right? So this conclusion should be understood as tentative in an incredible number of ways. So first of all, I haven't seriously argued that the epistemic appearances about ethics that I've identified are the most important and central ones, and there aren't other ones that are going to make things much more complicated. I haven't seriously argued that the significance of methodological naturalism is the unique mid-level epistemic principle that we should be pointing to by way of thinking about how to um, assess or understand these epistemic implications. Um, and I also haven't gone around and looked comparatively at other metaethical theories and asked, how are those theories going to do once we deploy the same kind of methodology? And so in order to actually say that I'm going to get some sort of uh, bump to the credibility of this view on the basis of this methodology, I'd actually have to do that hard work. And I haven't done that. I want to be clear. There's only so much I can do in 40 minutes. Um, and really, what I want to close with is, I really intend this talk less to be an advertisement for joint carbon order of realism. You're not going to be sold. I have no illusions. Um, but more as a kind of advertisement for the methodology that I've tried to deploy here. So I think when metaethicists are developing systematic views about the nature of the thought and talk and the nature of the properties, 
they should be paying attention to the immigration challenge, and when they're addressing that immigration challenge, I think it behooves them not to just try to offer a highly controversial fundamental epistemological theory that happens to square with their view, but rather to think about what are these mid-level epistemic principles that they can appeal to, and how do things look for their view on that basis. Thank you. Uh, thank you for, for having me. Uh, thank you for this great talk. Um, so, uh, in, in the written paper, uh, towards the end, Professor uh, Mekerson wrote, uh, I strongly suspect that many readers will find this paper profoundly unsatisfying. And the, and the reason for this was that, he, he, uh, on the, the view that he sketched, uh, what we ended up with was that knowledge is likely, but not how we, we, we get it. So, uh, so I have no uh, such complaints, and to be perfectly honest, if, even if I did, I don't think I would have dared. Uh, say it, uh, <laughs> but I really don't. <laughs> so, uh, so the, the question he addresses are, are uh, very important ones, and the answer uh, he provides are uh, certainly they certainly offer much food for thought, and, and so yeah. Uh, so he defends uh, two uh, methodological claims. Uh, the first one is that uh, metaethicists uh, should focus on the epistemology of ethics. Uh, since their views face uh, an instance of what he calls, uh, following Christopher Peacock, uh, the integration challenge. And the second claim is that uh, they should engage in non-fundamental uh, epistemological theorizing in order to meet uh, the, this challenge. So the first claim, I think, is uh, relatively uncontroversial, uh, if there is uh, such a thing in, in philosophy. Uh, so, of course, one could argue about uh, what the best way to formulate the challenges, and I, I will have a few things to say about that uh, near the end of my, of my commentary. Um, uh, nevertheless, I take it that most metaethicists would probably agree that the, the metaphysics and epistemology uh, need to be simultaneously um, acceptable. Uh, yeah, and this is how Peacock uh, understands, I think, the, the, the challenge. And also, that part of the metaethicist's uh, job is to show that uh, the view in the fence satisfies this, uh, this condition. Uh, moreover, I think it's also fair to say that metaethicists already focus on the epistemology of ethics uh, to a large extent, although if the, the, the second claim is right, they may not do so in the, in the right way. Uh, so I, the, the, what I mean to say is that the second claim is potentially uh, where the, the philosophical action is, the, the one that's more uh, controversial. So it proposes a methodology that differs uh, significantly from uh, the way metaethicists uh, typically deal with the epistemological part of uh, what he calls in the paper, at the <coughs> end, uh, in the talk, but the, the metaethical project. Uh, so roughly, the, this method, the, the usual method, is by matching their preferred metaethical view with uh, uh, some systematic epistemological theory, whether it be uh, quantism, or reliability reliabilism or, or some such thing. Uh, so one might think that uh, some people would want to defend the more traditional approach against uh, the criticisms that uh, Mickerson levels in the talk and in the paper. Uh, so in any case, since I think that's where the, the philosophical action is, I will mostly focus on this second claim in, in what follows, and I will pursue uh, the line of objection that I just mentioned uh, in a way that I hope will invite further uh, discussion. So the, the idea is not to, to cast doubt on the, the non-fundamental uh, project that, that was sketched, uh, but to maybe raise a few, uh, a few questions that, given the, the somewhat programmatic nature of, of the paper, uh, <laughs> seem, seem to, to remain open. Right. So, um, so what, uh, what Professor McPherson suggests is that we should uh, cast the extananda, uh, which, it, which are the, the, the three uh, central appearances of the epistemology of, of ethics in non-fundamental terms. This also didn't really come up, I think, in the talk. Uh, and, and then seek uh, an explanation that's also non-fundamental uh, non for, uh, for those appearances. So uh, one way to defend a more traditional approach would be to argue that there is really no way around uh, fundamental epistemological theorizing. Uh, so, in other words, one could argue that the, the broadly naturalist, naturalistic, non-fundamental epistemic uh, picture that was sketched in the paper is, in fact, uh, fundamental in some respects. Now, to be sure, uh, 
uh, Professor Mekerson clearly does not aim to spell out a, a systematic epistemological uh, theory. But nevertheless, he, he, make, he makes a few assumptions that uh, one could reasonably, reasonably construe as strong. So the parallel that he draws uh, with paradigmatic scientific methodology, for instance, uh, uh, is one that some non-naturalists uh, might be inclined to, to reject. Uh, so it, it, it is a mistake, you might think, uh, to try to explain the appearances of the epistemology of, of ethics by focusing on uh, such things as uh, the methodological marks of high quality scientific research. Uh, so it's not entirely clear, at least to me, what the, the dividing line is between uh, fundamental and non-fundamental as it is used in, in the paper. Uh, so in most cases, as I understand it, the, the relevant sense of non-fundamental has to do with being as theory-free as possible, and, and the term so understood it, is applied to ethical principles, to the explananda themselves, and also to uh, epistemological uh, theorizing. And now I certainly agree with what appears to be a, a key motivation for this approach, so whenever uh, controversial assumptions can be avoided in making an argument, explaining a phenomenon, and so on, uh, Metaethicists uh, would do well to, to avoid them. Uh, and the main problem with the traditional uh, approach, as uh, Professor McPherson points out, is precisely that it relies on strong assumptions about the fundamental nature of epistemology. And this gives us, this gives us reason to doubt that engaging in fundamental epistemological theorizing will help meet the integration challenge. And so the question then that I want to raise is whether or not uh, non-fundamental theorizing, as uh, exemplified in the paper, makes such assumptions. And so I, I, I end with a, a somewhat different issue. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning that one could argue about the best way to, uh, to understand the, the deintegration challenge and to try to solve it. Uh, so Christopher Peacock, when, when he introduces the, the challenge in the opening pages of uh, Being Known, uh, acknowledges that the problem of reconciliation uh, may take various forms uh, depending on the subject matter under consideration. Uh, so he writes, and I'm going to quote, uh, we may have a clear conception of the means by which we ordinarily come to know the statements in question, yet at the same time we may be unable to provide any plausible account of the truth, conditions, knowledge of whose fulfillment could be obtained by these means. Alternatively, we may have a clear conception of what is involved in the statement's uh, truth, but be unable to see how our actual methods uh, of forming beliefs about their subject matter can be sufficient for knowing their truth. And in some cases, we may be unclear on both counts. Now, this last possibility that we, that we may be unclear on both counts uh, correctly describes, I think, uh, the, the state of affairs, the current state of affairs in the area of uh, ethics. So there is as much disagreement uh, over the metaphysics of ethics as there is uh, over its epistemology. Uh, so does this fact, if, if it, is, it is indeed a fact, have any implications for how we should understand the integration challenge and try to, to solve it? So there are, uh, how am I doing for time? Am I Okay. Uh, so there are there are at least uh, seven possible ways uh, Peacock tells us in his book to respond to uh, an integration challenge in any uh, given area. So I'm just gonna focus on two of those, uh, which he calls conservative solutions, uh, because they seem uh, more relevant to to one of Professor McPherson's aim, which is to vindicate the uh, the appearances, not to uh, debunk them. So the first kind of response would be to, and I quote again from Peacock's book, uh, reconceive our metaphysics of ethics in such a way as to integrate our view of truth in that domain with the epistemology appropriate to that domain. The other response uh, kind of runs in the other direction, and it involves instead reconceiving the epistemology uh, for the statements that led to the problem of integration. And so uh, Professor McPherson's Proposed methodology, uh, I believe, is an instance of this second type of, uh, of response. So the joint carding account uh, that, he, that he proposed uh, centrally involves some pretty fundamental uh, metaphysical theorizing, uh, which is how uh, leading proponents of such approaches think of their, of their, um, of their project also, I think. Uh, and so this, 
fundamental metaphysical uh, picture is held fixed and the epistemological consequences are explored in non-fundamental uh, terms. And this is in large part because assumptions about the fundamental nature of epistemology are controversial, as I said. So uh, given that assumptions about the fundamental nature of metaphysics are also quite controversial, the question I would like to raise is uh, whether a case could be made for responding to the integration challenge in the opposite way. Uh, so could one instead all fix uh, a, a fundamental epistemological theory that he's confident about, whether uh, reliabilism or whatever, uh, and work out instead its metaphysical implications in non-fundamental uh, metaphysical theorizing. Uh, and so would there be reasons to prefer one way instead of the other to uh, dealing with, uh, with the project? So I'm going to end this with, uh, with this question. Thank you.